In seminary, I learned in preaching class that uh, the introduction to a sermon should be brief and should get everyone's attention. So, sex. <laughs> now that I have your attention, let's look in Proverbs and learn how wisdom helps us fight for faithfulness and against sexual immorality. Uh, Proverbs 5 and 6 and 7 all teach the same lesson, and we'll look at all of these together. We'll go back and forth some, so I ask your patience. As before, we listen in as a father speaks to his son, prepares him for life. And the fact that there are three large discourses here should tell us something about the importance that this topic is for us as followers of Christ. It's important for our lives, our marriages, for our relationships if we are not married. So we'll hear the father warn his son against being led astray by an immoral woman. That's sort of the, the pattern in all three chapters. And to be sure, there are wicked and immoral women who have ruined the lives of good men. But there are also wicked and immoral men who know just what to say to a woman to win her body, her affections, her life, and then proceed to ruin that life. And these, this text applies to that situation as well. Just know that. There's really only one good man in this whole story, and his name is Jesus. Okay. So three chapters taken together give us, I believe, four lines of defense against sexual immorality. And the first is to treasure wisdom. We see this in the opening verses of chapter 5 where the father says this to his son, My son, pay attention to my wisdom. Turn your ear to my words of insight that you may maintain discretion and your lips may preserve knowledge. So one thing to note is that the word that's translated maintain there in verse 2, it is the same Hebrew word that we found in chapter 4 where, you, where we're told to guard our hearts. Okay? The same word. So this is not accidental. We are building on what we've learned before. And we have to guard our hearts. We treasure wisdom, delight in wisdom, so that we might maintain discretion and preserve knowledge because we need them, because the world is a fallen and broken place. Now, there's something very similar in chapter 6. Uh, the father adds that this, not, this instruction is not just from him, it's also from the son's mother, and that wisdom provides constant guidance and correction all throughout the day and throughout life. And then in chapter 7, there's something similar, but the emphasis there is that we're told to treasure wisdom, to, to delight in it like a family member that we love dearly, that we trust and respect, someone whose counsel we would receive uh, immediately without question. I don't know about you, uh, at least in my, in my case, you know, a certain uncle just pops into mind of somebody, if he said anything, I would trust him. Always happy to see him, just, you know, that's, that's the word picture that comes to my mind there. Um, so this reminds us, as we think about guarding our hearts, about treasuring wisdom, that the fight for faithfulness, the fight against immorality, starts long before there is any temptation. It starts long before you are in that critical situation. It starts with our hearts. It starts with having a heart attitude of delight in the Lord, like Psalm 37, delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. So it starts with having a delight in the Lord, but also a healthy distrust of ourselves and of our motives. So let's look at how this is stated in chapter 6, verse 25. He says, do not lust in your heart after her beauty. So there's notice, that's, that's where the problem is. It, the, the problem is in the heart. Chapter 7, again, verse 25. Do not let your heart turn to her ways or stray into her paths. A few months ago in the U.S., uh, the pastor preached a sermon on a, a topic similar to this, and and he talked about putting sin to death. And there was a man in that church who left the church and within a short time had uh, gone to a massage parlor and killed several people. And, of course, there was a link drawn immediately to that. Uh, as far as I can tell, there's nothing wrong in what was in the sermon. But there was something deeply wrong in that man's heart because a uh, catastrophic loss of life. And yet it did not solve the problem. The problem was in his heart. That's, that's where it always starts. It starts in the heart. You cannot blame someone else. We, we just, we can't shift blame. We must treasure wisdom, and we have to work on our own hearts. 
uh, guard our hearts. And as we treasure wisdom, we learn to see things as they really are, which leads to our second line of defense against sexual immorality, and that is beware of deception. And you see uh, longer passages there in, in all three chapters. The father tells his son that wisdom will keep him. And again, that same word, guard, again, it's there. We keep wisdom, we treasure wisdom, and wisdom keeps and protects us as well. So he is to keep wisdom so that wisdom will keep him from allowing his heart to be deceived by an immoral woman. Now, deception, this kind of deception can come by sight, as we've already seen, chapter 6, verse 25. Do not lust in your heart after her beauty. So that is something that the eye sees. Don't let her captivate you with her eyes. Um, but in, in chapters 5, 6, and 7, most of the emphasis is on deception that comes through words upon what is, is spoken. It's through de- seductive speech. So chapter 5 and verse 3 says this, and chapter 6 and 7 say something almost identical. For the lips of the adulterous woman drip honey. Now, that's gross, but it's figurative, Okay. <laughs> The lips of an adulterous woman drip honey. That is, they are sweet. They are deceptively sweet. Her speech is smoother than oil, but in the end. But in the end. So that's where we have to think. Beware, beware of the deception. And the deception, so it comes through images, images real of of someone you see in passing, someone you encounter in the course of a day. It can be virtual as in an image, phone or computer. It is incredibly accessible in our day, right? Um, and, and all of these, and, and they come through words, and all, all, whether it's by sight or by sound, it all appeals to a God-given desire, but in a twisted way. And it has catastrophic, disastrous consequences. Then chapter 7, the father does this, teaches this lesson through telling a story. So he says in verse 6 of chapter 7, At the window of my house, I looked down through the lattice, I saw among the simple, I noticed among the young men, a youth who had no sense. Now notice this youth is described as, he's simple, he's young, and he had no sense. Like, well, like a lot of young boys I know, (laughs) like my own sons, like I was when I was that age, not not a lick of sense. Um, But that's in contrast to the fool or the mocker who has rejected wisdom. Here is someone who who is, is young, Hasn't learned, hasn't rejected wisdom, but he's very vulnerable to making choices that are, in fact, incredibly foolish. So he's capable of learning, but vulnerable to folly. Then in verse 8, he was going down the street near her corner. He's walking in the direction of her house at twilight as the day was fading, as the dark of night set in. So he's intentionally walking in the direction of her house. And as he's doing this, it is getting progressively darker. And then, again, that is no accident. He is already making choices that put himself in a very vulnerable position. But he seems to be in denial about this. He seems to want to claim, like, well, I would just, I had no idea I was heading this direction. Oh, he knew. He knew. He did not want to admit it to himself, but he knew. He knows, he knows where he is going at some level of his being. But it is as if he expects, because it's dark, his actions will remain shrouded in secrecy. But as night gives way to day, secrets give way to exposure. And exposure is as certain as the sunrise. So don't fall for that. Beware of deception. As we continue reading, notice her sensuality. That is, she appeals directly to four, if not five, of his senses. Sight, sound, smell, touch, and even maybe taste. So in verse 10, out came a woman to meet him dressed like a prostitute and with crafty intent. So there is sight. She is dressed in a provocative manner, and that attracts his attention. Now it describes her, it says she is unruly and defiant. Her feet never stay at home. She's now in the street, now in the squares. At every corner she lurks. So just notice if, if you've been here for others of uh, these messages from Proverbs, the, the problem is often... But the conflict here is there is someone who is not on the right path. They were on the path. They have, they have abandoned the place where they should be, where the path of life in some way or another. And they want you to join them. They want, in this case, they want the son to join them on the road to destruction. And that, that's another one of those scenarios here. Verse 13, she took hold of him. She kissed him with a brazen face, she said. And here, here comes the sound, right? Everything she says now appeals to his ears. She's appealed to his sight with the first thing he sees, but now she is offering 
She's attacking the sense of sound. She says, today I fulfill my vows and I have food for my fellowship offering at home. Now notice the pretext of religious devotion. That, that may help maybe just uh, diminish the sense of guilt and shame over what's about to happen. With her mouth, she is claiming religious devotion. Her actions speak otherwise. It's, it's like a few couples I have known over the years who, who are living together without being married. And they, they say, well, we prayed about it first. Like, let me just say, there are some things you do not need to pray about whether you should do or not. And that is one of them. <laughs> you just, yeah, I know it makes you feel better. It's no more right. It's just not. So in verse 15, she says, so I came out to meet you. I've looked for you and I have found you. Now notice her appeal to his ego. I came out to meet you. I've looked for you. I have found you. And he gets a sense, wow, you've been like thinking of me all day, looking for me. No. Remember what it says up in verse 12? She's never at home, always in the street, in the squares, every corner she lurks. She was looking for anybody. She is lying. This is complete and utter deception. She says, now again, think of the senses. I have covered my bed with colored linens from Egypt. Okay, so here's sight, picture, picturesque room, bed, okay. Linens, no doubt, high quality, comfortable, pleasant, pleasurable to lie on. Verse 17, I have perfumed my bed with myrrh and aloes and cinnamon. There's the smell. There's perfume and all of these spices that just bring an incredibly pleasant aroma. Come, let's drink deeply of love till morning. And, and maybe the reference to drink might even get us to taste. I don't know. But it says, let us drink deeply of love till morning. Let's enjoy ourselves with love. And some translations say, let's delight ourselves with caresses. The idea there is, there is touch there. There is, um, you know what's there. So um, she says, let's drink deeply of love till morning. But be very sure what she is describing is not love. It is not. This is the opposite of love. Not, not love versus hate. It's love versus lust. It is destructive and it will consume them both. And, um, you know, love, love this, is, this is just not love. I, as I, I read this, I think, what's a good picture of love? And my mind went to my mother who, um, after my dad died, she remarried. She married a man. You know, long family history, that's fine. But in his final illness, she was with him in the hospital from morning till night and would only leave because we just said, you have to get rest because you're going to have to be here tomorrow. She, she said, this, this is where I belong. This is my place. And you know, she could only leave if she was sure that one of his sons would be there, that, that he would never be alone until she returned. And she would show up early in the morning dressed, well, like, like Southern ladies dress, okay? Just, I want to say dress for a funeral, but that seems a bit morbid in that context. But seriously, dressed, stood, stood at his bedside for hours. That, 22 years of that kind of relationship, that's, that's love. This is not love, friends. Don't, don't be deceived by what people call love. And I can assure you, no matter how deeply they drank of love, they woke up just as thirsty as they had been the night before because this is deeply, deeply unsatisfying. Then in verse 19, she says, My husband is not at home. He's gone on a long journey. He took his purse filled with money. He'll not be home till full moon. Okay, fairly, fairly predictable return time. So she is offering a night of pleasure, no commitment, no strings attached. Above all, no consequences. No one will ever know. Well, what happens? How does it turn out? We'll see. The curtain falls on this act of the play. We come then to our third defense against immorality. Don't worry, we will come back. Uh, if you've read, there's already a spoiler, so the day's just full of spoilers here. Um, the third line of defense is to consider the consequences. We've seen this multiple times already in our study of Proverbs, the emphasis between actions and consequences. Considering the consequences should affect the choices that we make today. And chapter 6 tells us the consequences are inevitable in this particular, in this sin. He's, 
It says in chapter 6, verse 27, Can a man scoop fire into his lap without his clothes being burned? Obviously, no. Can a man walk on hot coals without his feet being scorched? No. So is he who sleeps with another man's wife. No one who touches her will go unpunished. Perhaps in life, perhaps in eternity, but be very sure it will happen. So we return to chapter 7 to see the final act of the play. Verse 21, it says, With persuasive words she led him astray. She seduced him with her smooth talk. And all at once, you know, and I mean, I've, I've issued the Proverbs challenge, right? You know, read, the, read a chapter for every day, you know, according to the day of the month. So, you know, virtually every month on the 7th, I'm reading this chapter and I think, what's he going to do? <laughs> it is the same way every time. All at once, he followed her for a few minutes of pleasure that was soon over and soon forgotten as the consequences of his actions unfolded. He followed her, not like a man going to conquest, but like an ox going to slaughter. Like a deer stepping into a noose, till an arrow pierces his liver, like a bird darting into a snare, little knowing it will cost him his life. And he wakes up and says, this is not what I signed up for. Well, it is. You were in denial, but this is it. This is, this is what happens. Now in chapter 5, we see more consequences unpacked for us. Chapter 5 and verse 8, the father says to the son, Keep to a path far from her. Don't go near the door of her house, lest you lose your honor to others and your dignity to one who is cruel. So here we have shame, loss of dignity, loss of reputation. You destroy in a few minutes what takes you years to build. Years of faithfulness in marriage destroyed by one act of unfaithfulness and, and, and marred. Even if the marriage recovers and stays together, it is marred that it always casts a shadow on that relationship. Devastating impact on the, the aggrieved spouse, on children, on everybody who knows, on the wider community. Everybody's future relationships are affected by this. All for a few minutes. The, it's the poem, The Debt, by Paul Lawrence Dunbar, quoted beautifully by Robert G. Lee in his famous sermon, Payday Someday in the 50s. This is the price I pay just for one riotous day, just for one riotous day. Years of regret and grief and sorrow without relief. Don't go there, okay? I beg you. Verse 10, he says, Lest strangers feast on your wealth and toil and rich the house of another. At the end of your life you will groan when your flesh and body are spent. So here, not just shame, loss of honor, but here is loss even of, of livelihood and, and wealth. It, the idea may be of, that he had to make, would have had to make some kind of restitution to the, the wrong party, but it also may have meant that in this case, this would be someone banished. So they're put out of home, put out of town. And everything they have worked for, home, garden, yard, farm, whatever they had is no longer theirs. Everything they have worked for to this point, it is gone. They no longer have access to it. And the flesh and body are spent. So now he's old. There is no opportunity to repair, no opportunity to recover. There's no starting over. It is done. And you have lost it just for a few moments of pleasure. Don't, don't do that. Consider the consequences. And so there is regret then in verses 12 and 13. You will say how I hated discipline, how my heart, see where the problem is. He, thankfully, he doesn't say, oh, if only she hadn't come. No, the problem was in his heart. That's what he acknowledges. You will say how I hated discipline, how my heart spurned correction. I would not obey my teachers or turn my ear to my instructors. And you will look back with regret and you'll look back and wish You'd made a different choice. And yes, there is forgiveness. And yes, there is a way to move forward. But there is no undoing the past. And it will, it will be there. Verse 14, he says, I was soon in serious trouble in the assembly of God's people. So here's public shame and judgment. Now in Israel, this sin could be punished by stoning. That, not something we face today. But there is still even in New Testament times, there is accountability even in God's people and in your wider community. You always have to answer for these actions. Chapter 6 adds the dimension of the understandable fury of a wronged spouse. Verse 34 of chapter 6, for jealousy arouses a husband's fury and he will show no mercy when he takes revenge. 
Now, perhaps no story in modern times illustrates the, the deception and consequences more graphically than Ashley Madison. This is the Canadian website that was set up to enable married people to have affairs. The tagline, the motto is, life is short, have an affair. Began in 2000, oh, they promised um, complete anonymity, 100% discreet service. Uh, they established in 2002, and by 2015, they had 37 million members. Complete anonymity. No one will ever know. Then, on August 28, 2015, Ashley Madison's entire database, names, addresses, sexual preferences, and more, it had been stolen by hackers and it was put online for everyone to see. An untold number of infidelities were exposed. Marriages and families collapsed. It's estimated that three to 400 Christian leaders were exposed in this. About a week later, an American pastor, seminary professor in the, in the US took his own life rather than face the consequences of this. It's devastating. No one will ever know, really. It's night, what could happen? Well, sunrise. It, it always comes. And to add insult to the deception, what was learned is that what came to light in, in, in the course of investigation is that a lot of the, the female members of Ashley Madison were, were bots. They were just automated programs. And so men engage in this, they pay money, they think they're talking to a woman who feeds the ego and maybe a relationship. And, and it's not even real. Not even real. So don't fall for this deception. And consider the consequences of choices. You, you will live with some of these consequences, these, these choices the rest of your life. I had a couple of friends in, in university days who, who got their girlfriends pregnant. Uh, one married the girl. The marriage didn't last. He's still around. That relationship is just there. And another friend told me he had paid for more than one abortion. And if he has any conscience at all, he feels some guilt over that. And I'm sure the girl or multiple girls deal with the harm and the guilt and the, the remorse from that choice. So just think about the choices you make and what you're going to be living with the rest of your life. So friends, consider the consequences. Fear the Lord, treasure wisdom, guard your hearts. Look beyond the pleasure of the moment. See the broken relationship, see the shame and regret and loss. See the pain of the loved ones you betray. And don't start down that road, please, please, I beg you. Finally, to avoid sexual immorality, to be faithful, we must in fact be faithful. And that's really emphasized beautifully in chapter 5. And by faithful here, I mean a couple of things. First, I mean this relationship is to be enjoyed in the context of covenant marriage. See, when we hear warnings like today and we hear consequences, warnings against sexual immorality, we tend to think, well, God hates sex. Um, sex is bad. Um, we tend to have a negative view of sexual desire. That is actually not biblical. You may be surprised to learn that. The Bible actually gives us a, a positive view of sex. In fact, some passages are so explicit, um, you just might blush. And I've just started a bunch of you going to read your Bibles this week. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you where, you just have to read, okay? <laughs> I'll get you in the Bible one way or the other. Well, in Genesis 1 and 2, God created Adam and Eve. He blessed them, and his first command to them was to be fruitful and multiply. To fill the earth. He doesn't hate sexual relationship. He created it. He, he, he invented, created pleasure. He created this. He established marriage as a covenant relationship between a man and a woman. As the only proper context for the sexual relationship. Now Adam and Eve's sin had disastrous effects on their relationship with God and with creation, with, with each other. Especially in this area. And that which was intended to be an expression of love for one's spouse that can lead to life became an expression of love for oneself that can lead to death. Something so precious, so complex, so beautiful, the, the consequences of twisting it and, and of misusing it are disastrous. 
And that's what Proverbs warns us against today. Even though we live in a fallen world, marriage continues as established by God. The sexual relationship is an important part of the married life, even today. It is the gift of God to a man and woman in the covenant of marriage. It is complex. It is profound. It is mysterious. It is pleasurable. It is to be enjoyed. And it is life-giving. New life can be created through this act of love between a husband and wife. And this is behind the positive command that we find in chapter 5. He says in verse 15, Drink water from your own cistern, running water from your own well. Should your springs overflow in the streets and your streams of water in the public squares, let them be yours alone, never to be shared with strangers. May your fountain be blessed, and may you rejoice in the wife of your youth. A loving doe, a graceful deer, may her breast satisfy you always. May you ever be intoxicated, literally stagger with her love. This is intended to be enjoyed as a part of married life. It's compared to drinking refreshing water. Now, we shouldn't understand these verses to think that because this is the father talking to the son, that the man is the only person who matters in this relationship, uh, that the wife is merely the object who exists solely for her husband's pleasure. For example, Paul in 1 Corinthians 7 tells believing couples, first, they should engage in this relationship and they should not deprive one another. Uh, They have a mutual duty to one another, and by being married, they have yielded authority over their own bodies to their spouse. I don't know how much you know about the English Puritans, but uh, they understood this. And in fact, there was one record of uh, a Puritan church actually excommunicating a man for neglecting his wife in this area. Now, that had to be one of the most interesting business meetings in the history of Christianity. So they were serious about it. It's good and it's right for in this relationship in marriage, but understand it is sacred, it is holy, it is set apart. It belongs only to man and woman in the covenant relationship of marriage. As Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 4 says, Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. So as I said, something is beautiful and complex. As, as this is, we can understand why the consequences of perverting it and twisting it would be so devastating. But that is what happens. That is what our age give us, gives us. So we need to understand that, that any twisting of this brings devastating consequences. It is rebellion against God's design. This means having sexual relations with someone with whom you are not married, whether this is a, a casual relationship or a committed relationship. Whether it's an affair, one party is married or not, It belongs to a husband and wife in the covenant of marriage. It includes homosexual acts. It includes consuming pornography, along with criminal acts like sexual abuse and rape and pedophilia and incest and more. Uh, These things are a part of our society and they're devastating. And people are, are wounded and broken. And let me say, if you are struggling in any of these areas, please let us walk with you through this, okay? The world will be quick to give you an identity and a label and encourage you into a, push you into a lifestyle and behavior that may in fact destroy you and, and bring even further death, um, destruction and devastation into your life. You are more than your urges. You are more than what has been done to you. You can find an identity in Christ and you can have some choices about how to live. So these things don't have to consume you. Please, please know that. Now, another question that comes up is, if, if this relationship is for the man and woman in covenant relationship, well, what if I'm not married? Well, this is the second thing I mean by be faithful. You be faithful to the Lord, whatever your current status. Whatever the reason, if you're not in the covenant of marriage, sexual activity is not an option for you today. What about tomorrow? Well, same answer, but just take it a day at a time, okay? Just... Just today, but yeah, tomorrow the answer is the same. And hear me clearly, whether you're looking forward to marriage, whether you're widowed or divorced, whether you're single by choice or by God's providence, you are a vital part of our church family, okay? Uh, The family of God grows not by reproduction, but by regeneration. And you are very much a part of our family, whether uh, you are married or not, and whether this is something that's part of your life right now or not. 
Let me say to the young, which is everyone younger than I am, which is 95% of you, um, this age will tell you that waiting is impossible. It's not realistic. It is not impossible. You can wait. You can wait for something if it's important enough to wait for. So we wait. And that takes us back to what our hearts treasure. It's not impossible, but it is difficult. It's difficult because we have strong desires that are God-given in order to lead us to marriage. And that's not a bad thing. But waiting is made more difficult by the accessibility of instant gratification that this age offers. So the images, the sounds, you can find them, phone, computer, television, if any of you even remember television. Um, Instant gratification, no commitment, and it makes us even more vulnerable to pornography and hookup sites, things like that. There's the sexualization of virtually everything around us that awakens and feeds that desire. It is everywhere. It's in advertisements. It's, it's, it is everywhere. And then there is the normalization of sexual immorality in virtually every song sung and every story told in print and on screen. Some places quite explicit. It's captured well in a song I heard on the radio here last week. Baby, you and me ain't nothing but mammals. Yep, you know the song. So let's do it like they do it on Discovery Channel. I thought, your mothers must be so proud of you. (laughs) Are you guys serious? I looked up the song, and that is actually the cleanest line in the whole song. It's horrible. It is degrading and profaning. When you think about the beauty of this relationship that God has created for husband and wife to fill the earth blessed, he's He's not the enemy of sex. He's he's the creator of it. And yet to see it twisted and perverted like this and to see it cheapened with a song like this, and and of course that's an extreme example. But that is what our age does with this. And it will destroy you. You are more than a mammal. (laughs) You are more than your urges. You are more than, than what your body wants. Okay. Find... Understand who you are in Christ and commit, commit to being faithful. I know it is difficult, okay? I know it is difficult to wait. I was 29 when I got married. We waited for each other. It was difficult to wait, but we waited. And, as, and we we're thankful that as we entered married life, one thing we didn't have was regrets about choices we made before. So hear me. I know what it is to wait. I know what it is to struggle. It is worth waiting for. And by the way, of course, a lot of waiting is praying. And every time you pray, you're talking to a man who will never have sex. Okay? So, you can wait. I know, that's probably gross to some of you. But we have, as our wonderful example in Jesus, who did not take advantage of others when he certainly could have, but he lived and died sacrificially. So trust him, pray to him. He does understand those weaknesses. He does. Now I want us to see as we move toward closing, that that is coming, a tremendous example of the kind of faithfulness I'm talking about. Joseph was a young man. You know, he'd been sold by his brothers into slavery, taken to Egypt, so he's separated from his family, separated from all the moral restraint that home and family bring, sold as a slave. He finds himself placed over responsibility over the the household of his Egyptian master. And then his master's wife began to try to seduce him. Day after day, she tried to seduce him. He had every reason to give in, okay? But see his response to us in Genesis chapter 39, it's there on the slide. He said, no one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? So notice, Joseph was not blinded by the moment. He did exactly what we're talking about today. First, he saw through her deception. He called her advances exactly what they were. This is wickedness and sin against God. Okay. Second, he considered the consequences. He compared what he would gain, a few moments of pleasure, to what he would lose. He's saying, my master has withheld nothing from me 
except you. That's, I have everything, I have access to everything my master owns. And at that point, he was in a position of responsibility. Everything that he had at that point would be put at risk with that choice. And he just did the pro and con and said, nope, not worth it. Not going to fall, not going to bow. And he was faithful because he believed that marriage is sacred. Notice, here he is. He's not talking to a Jewish woman. He's talking to another culture, okay, a, a pagan woman. And yet, there's this common understanding that marriage is sacred. No society operates, functions well without a healthy view of marriage. And yet, he, he understood, even as a young man, he understood marriage is sacred. So, that's exactly what we're talking about today. So by being faithful, I mean if you are married, enjoy this sacred relationship with your spouse in the covenant of marriage, and be faithful to the Lord in this area of life if you're not married. Now friends, our, our world desperately needs men and women who, who will do this very thing, who will be faithful to the Lord in this area of life, who are determined to be faithful to God, who know that they are more than their urges and desires, know who they are in Christ, delight themselves in the Lord. And as God and this generation needs as God wills it, men and women who will stand before God and others and will pledge their lives and love to one another and keep their vows and live faithfully together until they are parted by death. This world needs you to be faithful. It is desperate. So treasure wisdom. It'll protect you when you're tempted. Don't be deceived by the allure of immorality. Look ahead to the consequences. Be faithful, as we've talked about. If you have had a failure in this area or multiple failures in this area, I want you to know there is hope in Christ. Okay? In his death, he took on himself the shame and the regret and the loss that broken adulterers like we all are deserve. And in his resurrection, he rose, overcame all the shame and all of the guilt, overcame death itself. And today, today, he offers you forgiveness and freedom and life if you will just turn from your sin and put your hope in him. And we pray you will respond, turn to him, today. And if you want to know more about what it means to know Christ, please, please see one of us after the service today. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these few moments before your word. We thank you for creation, all that you have given us, and pray that our hearts would be satisfied with you, that, that we would delight ourselves in you and trust you with the desires of our hearts. I pray for these friends. I pray you will take whatever's been true and good today and seal it into our hearts and help us, please, to treasure wisdom, to beware of deception, to consider consequences, and just to be faithful just today with what you ask of us. And we'll be back tomorrow to ask again. We love you. Thank you for all that you are to us. In Jesus' name, amen.